you know, it, it is kind of the, the, the embryo of where um, street music culture start from. You know, I myself, I was born in real tone. I used to have the real, real tone dance. And um, we are sound system upon the street. Now we have seen the sound system change in so many ways where selectors now would have turned from one time it was sound system when man a DJ upon man and man a DJ upon rhythm. Till after dog plate come in. Until now, man stop car box and record. Now they have MP3 and, and you know, it's just the whole thing. So we're discussing everything from the te technology change in itself, um, the relevance of it, how much people it reach, you know. Uh, first, from UA, UWI host, uh, Sanja Stanley, Nea, please. Come up, she's a, a host, and of course, Delana from Renaissance. Big selector, you know, big selector, yo, 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 yo. See? Um, oh, yeah, we've the secretary, so I'm going to sit on this one. And Creep Chromatic. Everybody knows Chromatic. Josh, what's your name? Josh, where are you? Come here, Josh. Gabriel Davis, Gabby, come now. And um, Panta Salvele. Bossy. Make some noise, everyone, for my life. And Sanja, you can't start it out. I'll just stay up one and we'll have a vibe. Greetings, everyone. I am CF1 Wood, right? No, I'm not convinced. I am Siago on good. Yes. I believe so, absolutely. Now, after what we've been just told, though, I just want to shift the energy to say that Peter is now an ancestor. And I want to say, uh, in my own spiritual tradition, we want to give praises to our ancestors all the time. So, may his soul rest in peace. Jamaica's national instrument is a sound system. We are about to celebrate a century of sound following the innovations of greats like Henry Jones. In the mid-1940s, following his return from World War II, he was the one responsible for the technology that went into the amplification of sound. Mexico City has some 10,000 sound systems. And Mexico has declared the sound system national heritage. The sound system is big business and Jamaica's story inside of that innovation is critical. So our panel is going to be looking at the sound system's relevance, impact, reach. I'm going to look at some important things with all of our panelists and I'm really very happy to be have been asked to chair this panel by the organizers I want to big up the three main persons and all the persons who have worked really hard on this music conference Shaggy you're a seven-time Grammy nominee Grammy winner Mr. Bombastic working since the early 1990s Jamaican American what role did sound system play in your career progression from amateur to pro I like that but they said the seven time win. <laughs> <laughs> but we can we can still still bat throw the bat, you know? Yeah. Um I started on sound system. Like like I start my my only was at that time it was our career was really a hobby. It started on sound system. I started DJ song, lift box, quality dance team. Everybody was a song man in here can probably attest to the fact that when you're going to the dance, you have a whole lot of people there to help you lift the box. When you're left another night, the whole of them gone. <laughs> everybody want to go in the dance for free, so they have to help you lift the box. Right? Specs, you know, matter. Thank God for laptop. So there we are, we get into that. So I, you know, I used to, to, to have, I have my own sound system called Magnax, and then we changed to Crystal, and then after a while, I used to DJ on a song called Gibraltar, out of Brooklyn. See, the first time I caught the bug of being a DJ artist, one night I go out to Skateland, and I had a picnic. 
and the thief out and go skate long and go watch the time the yellow man and the biggest star in the world. And we used to go to a crossroad to take bus, even though not, that's not my bus stop, but come when I see yellow man walk in a yellow sweatsuit. Because it was always a sighting. I don't know if anybody's from that time, from my era in time there, but he had that thing about him when yellow man was a really a people person as walk when we see my crossroad more time. And more time if you are little youth I walk and you see the yellow BMW that come, which you never drive yet because in the end of the passenger seat, you always my yellow man that. I saw him at skate line one night. We waited until late. Him walk in, take up the mic. Him sing probably about three or four songs and walk out. And the whole dance walk out of it. In the dance. And I said to myself, I want to be that guy. So it was inspiration for me. And that happened on a sound system. That happened, uh, I think that night, I think I can't remember which songs. I don't know if it was Lee's, Lee's, uh, Lee's Animated that played the night. But it was, it was one of those nights. So sound system, to me as a kid, was really what it was really, that was really the CNN of, of the inner city at the time. And uh, I think to, today it is still relevant. So let me go to Delano. Renaissance, the first song to be featured on international stations such as BET, MTV, Apollo, Showtime, and so on, almost 35 years in the business. And from a family in which music was very much present, how did you get involved in the sound system business? Well, I was born into it. My father was an electronic engineer and he used to build a lot of sound systems. He used to have a song called um, Plus X from Vineyard Town. And I never used to live with my father. But when I started living with my father, one night the guys them on the sound carried me on the road. Let them show me how they trim up the sound. And when I return home, we get a bus ass. <laughs> the next day my father sell the sound. The guitar never want to be in the sound system. He wanted me to be in his electronic shop that fixed amplifiers. Because I was interested in amplifiers and stuff, because I can fix amplifiers and stuff like that, I still get involved with the sound music. I used to break dance, I used to do everything to do with music. Um, if I was doing a, a prep school, I would have carried the biggest song to my class party, to, you know, that it had to go outside. To, to, to entertain the whole school. So after a while, my father realized the art. I can't stop it no more. He started helping me with the sound system. He said, Art, if you want to amplify, to tap one out of the shop and try and fix it. I couldn't even fix it. <laughs> I have to ask somebody to help me fix it. So basically, I have a lot of passion for sound system. Um, I grew into it, I know how it, how it started. I know what the, the what I have to go through as what Shaggy said. We used to have a whole heap people follow me with the sound and when the dance done and me when I fell lift the box them. Cause yeah, me used to lift speaker box. <laughs> me used to jump on back of the truck, me used to do everything for sound. So I know about sound system. My father even built Kilimanjaro too. When we used to have the grey box them that year. So I know everything about sound system. So although I might still look like twenty five. <laughs> This I've been through it, I experience it, and I love it. No, let me just admit that this is just wicked though for me to sit down for an hour to talk to six people, and I want to talk to each of them for an hour. This is like really wicked. So, chromatic. Some people might know your government name. I don't know if you want me to tell them. Warren B. Party sound with large followings in the UK, United States, Central America, and more. How did you get started in the sound system business? Well, for me, it was actually from the, mis the mixtape aspect of it. So, I uh, was messing around with him. At the time, he was big on the mixtape scene. This was really important, though, so it's, um, he actually gave me one of the software programs that he used to make mixtapes. Started messing around with it. It was just more so for my friends are just, you know, for the community. And just based off the reception, kept doing it, got more and more interested in it, and then that's what really snowballed into me, ultimately becoming a DJ. You are coming into the, the newer age in terms of Somewhat, technology. Somewhat, yeah. I, 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 I would have said I caught the last part of the mm -hmm. 
traditional era as far as the record boxes and CD pouches. For me, when I started, I was working in CD pouches, which it was you know, tedious to some extent. Again, thanks for laptop, but yeah, I, I, I basically would say I, I cut the last part of that era and bridged it over into what it's at now. Okay. So now we want to look at some of the, the ways in which people have in fact taken the sound system business and, and made it into a, an educational enterprise. So Joshua Chamberlain completed a PhD at the UWI in cultural studies and his research was on sound systems. What was the most important finding from your research, Joshua? What would you say? Thanks. Well, there's eight, ch Hello. Check. There's eight chapters, and I think each one of those chapters has something important. But I think the one that I seem to repeat the most is that, I think it was in 1973 that uh, Orlando Patterson said that every community in Jamaica should have a sound system. And that, to me, spoke to the reach and relevance of sound system to the communities, and everybody here has actually mentioned the community. So uh, that one seemed to stick with me the most, and it's the one that I think you don't really hear about so much anymore. Um, and of course, the educational aspect. One of the, one of the places I went to, to, to learn about their impact on sound system culture was the Alpha Boys School, where Yellow Man went to school, Ailawi went to school, uh, and they had a sound system. Sister Ignatius had a sound. And it was the idea of a sound system as a learning tool at that time. That's something that stuck with me and that the Alpha School of Music um, is, is informed by it today. And we're going to come back to the Alpha School of Music and what exactly is happening there and has happened there to influence Jamaica's sound system business. So Gabby, you are, you've been a DJ, uh, you, you are a DJ, but you're coming from modeling and reality TV, and you're back in Jamaica from Canada, um, where you were immersed yourself in, in the DJ culture. Your aim is to become one of the biggest female DJs in the business. Tell us how you're going to do that. Hello? Okay, just checking if my mic was on. <laughs> Um, well, to be honest, as you just covered that, it was more of a transition for me because I was already in the entertainment industry. Um, the plan is to just really embed myself in my Jamaican culture and represent for the women of Jamaica and the women in the industry. I think the industry needs a lot more female DJs, you know, we know what women want. Um, but I just plan to, to, to work on everything out here and get on some maybe like bigger shows, some fests, clubs, things like that. This is the place to say exactly what you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just, um, I kind of want to evolve, you know, in, in a steady pace, on, on a steady pace. So, wherever it takes me. Okay. Pantason, our sixth panelist, the dub plate legend, son of the nine-time world-class champion, Pink Panther, in case you didn't know. Number one dub plate agent in Jamaica, Grammy-nominated recording engineer for DJ Khaled, and music producer. How did you get started in the sound system business? Big up God, God above all the well, as you say, Father, the legend, mm -hmm. Big Panther, Father, see you, God, big up everybody from see you. You don't know, see you, I want to place places where the most famous artists that in that uh, come from, and sound system also. So, my father was around filing and Ricky Chopper in a see you, that place where we used to always go and dance, then team out and go and dance, then watch him play and everything there. But most of the time, my family keep the dance then. So after the dance finish, me always take up all of the buckle in you know, the dance and pull up at the crate. Because yeah. each crate full of buckle you carry on the bar, you get to a Heineken and you get to. So, so, so we really start and I don't know, because I couldn't make nobody see me in the dance. When I go into the dance, don't make it look like a morning, I come take up every buckle. You understand what I say? So, being that now, I was always interested in the art of the dub plate, like listening to how creative the dubs were. You see me? That's where my interest lie. It wasn't, although my father was a selector, 
I wasn't much interested in being a selector. I was more interested in the art of doubling. So that's how I became a recording engineer, you know, and started being in the studio, creating those dog plates, you know, to, and then listing them back. You understand? And for the people out there listening who don't know what a dog plate is, tell well, them. Well, a dog plate is an artist representing for a DJ in a specific song requested by the DJ. Alright, and of course you have specials, and there's a difference. Yeah, you have specials. Specials are songs that are not released. Because, uh, for example, you have song where people do a dub plate where they never release for a file file. So that's how no sound system like to have. Because that distinguishes them from everybody where make them stand up, make them play something. Because everybody always go in a studio and give one to kill a rhythm and say, kill a DJ something where nobody that have. You understand? So that's what the EM sound systems always try to have to separate themselves from everybody. Distinctiveness. Yeah. So Shaggy, you 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 your your career becomes formed in a moment where the foundation for Jamaican music was was very much set. And the foundation I'm talking about is the apprenticeship in the business. You you couldn't just come into music and say you have well in those days there was no laptop, but suppose there was a laptop, you have a laptop and you're suddenly um, a, a, a producer or anything like that. The foundation was one where you had to work your way into the business and become schooled as you're working your way into aspects of that business. We're seeing a dramatic shift now. The, the apprenticeship system is not there anymore. What has been the fallout? Well, I put it this way. The sound system itself was really a training program. It's really how you could, if you use a selector, and any any of them selector, you know that, you know that when them there in our ad, in our audience, depending on the time, how much audience, where, what country, who it is, that's when you make your playlist. Sometimes it's on the spot. That's called reading an audience, right? I see selectors where my mash up a dancer, so and then my go, a Germany or France or one of them other places there. And I'm going to change them to a, them old playlists or sometimes them just last and pop them and grow. Flat, zero forward. In the dance hall back in the days when you was a DJ, an artist with a DJ upon a song, I could have stereograph, I could have volcano, I could have jar, I could have whatever, stereomars, whatever the song is. You as that artist, as a DJ artist, had to read that audience based on the type of lyrics. So now a selector might be armed with dope plates, we as the artists are um, with lyrics and the lyrics will never chat on whichever beat we have to read the crowd at that point for the one said that tune you know what i mean if you if the tune if the audience in a certain certain vibe and you come with a slow one shot thing you might get a flap or it might go as far as get a boo especially when somebody is a car or a battle depends on how it go you know what i mean so that kind of harsh training ground made you a better artist because when you go to overseas now when you start doing your career you might end up on stage you got to understand when you look at some of these big acts in the world right now on stage they got smoke they got lights they got um pyrotechnics they got all these things that is making they got tons of dancers so they don't have to really feature on their own charisma as much and their most presence there's so many things that is given to them because they're a big artists, especially those manufactured artists, artists that you know that record labels spend at least five, ten million dollars on a rollout on one particular song, right? And they become massive. And now you sit them in an auditor in, in, in a coliseum with all these lights, and you say, "Wow, great shows!" And those shows become theatrical. It's not really the show that is that is really interactive with an audience. What the sound system does is teach you to be interactive with your audience. So basically, yes, I'm say being a man can start tapping foot up. When the whole sound system, when the whole band broke down, and it was all the man can tap him foot and get the crowd, I go, bam, bam, and bust a show. That's what sound system teaches you to do. That is gone. Now people, you see some man a clash now, and them a clash man doubly. And you see the dub this. Me guarantee you, if they put them in a forum up a sting, they're not gonna make it past one line because they might wick it on the dog. And sometimes the dog, you know, the man might talk about six man, I write them dog there. You know? 
Them sit down and write up the dub, them and rear, and them, 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 you, you DJ it, and you perform the, 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 the clash lyrics and everything. But then anyway, you come up with it. Both five or six other man help you do it. But when you're on the stage, it's just you and that audience and you and your, your opponent. You got to know how to read that crowd, read that clash, right? And come with that argument on point. That is missing to this day. That is why sound system is important. That's why I don't say people come back in the same farm. But there needs to be something to actually do what is known as artist development, right? Which is missing in today's day, especially in Jamaica music. And, and, and I want to follow up because I think you're the only one sitting on this panel that I can ask this question. When I think about you, Roy, and the vocal aesthetics that went into that 1960s, late 1960s, 70s time, when he said, where are you to the dance? Um, where are you to the ball? There is a certain degree of development, even of your vocal style that happens inside of that dance on the sound system live. Was that something that you benefited from? Absolutely, because you all know. If you are DJ upon a sound system every single night, and let me tell you, you know, the truth will have bunny, you know. The whole I say, your whole song tomorrow, man. At that point, you can know now as any trained vocalist, like Anadine Solalan can say, she sing from her gut compared to sing from your throat. And right? if you sing from up your alone, after a while, after a while, you have to know that they are breathing exercises, right? and vocal exercises that people teach in our school now, right, in vocal classes, right, that teach you how to sing and how to project and how to not be hoarse and how to, you know what I mean? But the sound system, you never know what teach you that. That is just raw, you are figure it out. And you have said, you think you, you think you have five man and DJ for that song? If your voice not work tomorrow, man, and you're a bad luck, that, because them man, they are shine over you. So you have to make sure you know so you could have smoke weed, burn cigarette, drink liquor, bam bam. But after that, a man vice starts so all like rock stone. Yeah! <coughs> it's a different soul you have developed. When I was in the military, they used to have me sing Keaton's cadences. Some used to sing, I don't know, but I've been told my CEO wears panty hose. I'm just gonna look a funny thing there. And they would call me off the front. And I'm running like five miles and singing that at the top of my lungs, right? In the, in the rain with a platoon behind me. And because I sang it and projected it and I had the knack of making up lyrics that was funny, the CEO always calls me out, the drug instructor always called me out to sing these cadences. And when I'm singing these cadences, I didn't know that was vocal training. Come here, sing from nowhere, so no one I run at the same time. So today, we can do show back to back, we can do them tours for a long time, I would, but that was my training. But I also was on sound system for a long time and DJ, so my voice was, was already developed to the point that when I did it like that, it, it was strong. Thank you for that. Now, Delano, I heard Matterhorn say something in a dance at Ben Bethurst's. I don't know how many of us in here remember. So you didn't have Ben Bethurst's? What? <laughs> Yo, listen! <laughs> ben Bethur says, um, Matahan says something on the mic. He said, this, this elector is like a psychologist. And it has stayed with me. I, I, in fact, it's, it's documented in my PhD. And, and, I, and I think to myself, how many DJs nowadays really understand themselves in that way? So tell me about your own role as a DJ now in a dance. You know, are you considering yourself like a psychologist? What are your methods to really move a crowd? Well, maybe I should start from here. I actually train DJs for the ministry. And when it came about, when it set out the bid and asking people to write, you know, modules and curriculum about training DJs, I didn't want to do it. Because I said, what, what am I going to you know, train DJs about? And um, a friend of mine who's a nurse educator, she overheard and said she wanted to help me. She actually put me through a training. <laughs> we had discussions, we, we talk about it. And then I realized that I'm really a psychologist. <laughs> it's being a DJ, 
Anybody can mix music. You understand? Anybody you can play music from your phone. I see DJs, professional DJs playing at a party and someone has come on their phone and mash up the DJ. Cause that person know what the, the audience want, because as they say you have to read the crowd. So all it is about is soft skills. DJs have to recognize their soft skills. What is soft skills? Soft skills is research. Soft skills is connecting with the crowd. You understand? Soft skill is understanding what you're supposed to understand in your purpose and how you're going to deliver. That's soft skills. So I was doing this all my life and didn't know because I had to figure it out. That's what Shadi said when he's on the sound system, I had to figure it out. When I was coming up, I didn't have no technology, no computer, no nothing telling me that I need to do this and I need to do that. I had to figure it out. How do I scratch? How do I scratch and not annoy the audience? How can I make everything that I do, you know, pleasing to the ears? I had places where I played before and people said, oh, why would I select that? Why am I do? Because I was experimenting. <laughs> I did not accept just watching somebody else playing and follow them. I might get ideas from them and then put it in my own way and deliver it. So for me, I always try to find ways of connecting with the crowd. Emotion intelligence is the next thing that a lot of people don't understand, which you have to understand people's emotion, understand and then control your emotions to, to actually understand what's come, what to come next. So it's all about reading the crowd. So that's what I train in my DJ training. So I. I agree with you what, what Matthew would say. Because if you do something and it don't work, you know, you have to find a way to come back home. You can't just go, ah. no. I have to find a way to finish on a high. Get up and say, yo, you know, sit down and drop down a little bit, but yo, don't wake it, yo, please smash up. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a thing where as DJs, we're always learning and, and, and figuring out stuff and stuff like that. I like that. As DJs, we're always learning because I think one of the most important things in life is to, is to recognize yourself always as a student. So, Chromatic, <coughs> how do you prepare yourself? I know you're, you know, you're probably DJ every night. How do you prepare yourself, newly, afresh, to go meet a crowd? Especially with what Delano just spoke about, knowing how to read the crowd. How do you prepare yourself? What what what, what do you take um, as your 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 most important ways to prepare yourself? Well, I would say by now at this point, being you know this many years in, you kind of have a feel for the events you're going to be DJ as soon as you see the flyer. Um, just. You know, man, there's many there's many ways to like figure out what where what what, what kind of setting you're gonna be in even before reaching there. Um, I try to reach a little bit early. Sometimes, if I can, to you know, see the crowd, assess them, which demographic it is, what age group. Um, but there's there's so many different ways. As far as preparation, in the way you probably mean, I just make sure my you know, my software is up to date, I have the drivers installed on my computer, that's, that's um, something that the software needs to connect to the hardware. Um, and just make sure I have whatever the new tunes are, and yeah, that's really about it as far so as preparation. So that's the technical side though. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you what I mean. I spoke to Rodigan once, and I was asking him, is there a method? Because I'm, I'm, this is something that I'm critically interested in now, this DJ method. And I'm, it's something I plan to ask all DJs. And what he, his response was related to preparation. You know, not just the technical side now, but how you prepare yourself. Mentally. Mentally. It's how you, how you, how you, you, you decide that you know, this crowd is, is a, going to be a particular kind of crowd. And you spoke some of that, but is there any other way that you prepare yourself? You're doing this day in, day out. It must get, does it get boring? What do you do to, to, to revive yourself? It's, it's more like second nature at this point. It's, it's actually the opposite for me. It's, 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 
like walking out on a stage there's no nerves or no none of that at this point you get me i mean there were days when they used that used to be the case but it's just second nature it's, it's, it's our life it's what we do like it's whatever you're good at whatever your purpose is that how easy these questions come and how easy it is for you to be who you are that's how easy it is for us like it's it's, it's a it's a talent that um it gets better with time. It gets better with time. Yeah, Connoisseur. so we're always learning. Josh, there we spoke. We, you, you began to speak about Alpha, the sound system, Sister Ignatius. And I know many persons in here may not be aware of that. Tell us who was Sister Ignatius, the sound system she had, and the kind of influence that that sound system would have had on the many persons who we now know would have been involved and been educated out of Alpha. Of course. I love to talk about the school. I love to talk about the sound system. The sound system so you'll have to stop me. But um, Sister Ignatius was the first nun to run the music department at the Alpha, at the, what was called the Alpha Boys School. Alpha uh, was an orphanage, actually. Started in 1880 uh, by a lady, a Kingston resident named Jessie Rapol. About 10 years later, she needed help. Um, and uh, this was down at 26 South Camp Road, where the school is still located. And as I said, after about 10 years, she needed help. The word went out, and the Sisters of Mercy from London replied and said, we're going to send you six sisters. Um, um, and um, from 1890 till now, the Sisters of Mercy have been operating the, the Alpha uh, program. And the first Jamaican nun to, to run the music program, which started in 1892, was Sister Ignatius. She was from Mandeville. Uh, so she understood the music, understood the power of music, understood um, the, the, the connections to the community and all of these aspects of music that, that, that the practitioners know. She essentially was a practitioner herself, um, a sound woman, a sound nun for sure. But um, there was a man on campus, a past student named Noel Davy, who had built a sound called Mutt and Jeff. She hired him, and he worked on the campus, she hired him for the school events, and he and Leighton Goff were the, actually operated the sound. One was tall, one was short, so they called it Mutt and Jeff, which is a comic strip, uh, still around today. But the, uh, uh, Sister Ignatius, he, he decided to get out of it, and Sister Ignatius said, I'll buy it. So she bought Mutt and Jeff, and used to hold, set up the sound, string it up on Saturdays for the students. So they would do, and these students were doing music hours and hours and hours. They were instrumentalists for the most part. Um, Johnny Osborne was a drummer. Alawi was a, no, Johnny Osborne was a trumpet player. Um, Alawi was a drummer. Um, and other people who didn't, weren't in the music program, Yellow Man, for example, had a chance to get on the sound. But Yellow Man says it was Sister Sound. That was the first sound system he dj on. Um, I love, he says, Sister Ignatius taught him to play sound. Um, many other people... For those who don't know who I love is, is there any... I'll give that prize. Anybody in here who knows who I love is? If you're under 50. <laughs> I say boom draw up there. You <laughs> say no. <laughs> Tell us who I love is. Can you give me my mic? <laughs> no microphone in the audience yet? Not yet. Oh my gosh. Yeah, all right, all right. We're going to come back to you. We're going to come back to you. Continue. So who it is? Who it is? Select of the Jalo. Select the Jalo. Absolutely. So it, it had this huge impact. And those are just the names. Like, there's people we don't know. Um, but sh I mean, there are people that we can talk to today who, who tell us that she, she used the sound because she wanted them to hear good music. And today we call that listening and appraisal, which is actually a class in formal universities and colleges. So she just knew this instinctively, but that was sound system at the time. It was done instinctively. I think, um, so we fast forward till today, and the Alpha School of Music, which is an associate degree program, said we have to add this. Um, so sound system performance is a required course at the Alpha School of Music for associate degree students. And it's the performance side. There are so many aspects that you could teach that, that should be teached. Uh, technical side, uh, um, the, the cables, and the building speaker box, and things like that. So we'll get there, but um, and Jamaica will get there too, I have no doubt. But Alpha has been in this for over a hundred years, music at least, and sound system is, is very much a part, I think, of what 
how this impact has been and, and the ability of the school and its students to make connections um, that, that allowed them to go through these experiences, you know, that, that Shaggy and Delano, um, and everybody here has mentioned, but they did that on campus um, as well as off eventually. Um, but those experiences are critical to the development of the artist. Thank you. Gabby, where, where did your love for music come from? And, and, and tell us a little bit about what has been the major stage that you've played on so far. Okay, so my love of music just, it's just always been, I've just always had a love for music. I've always been inspired um, by people around me. People on the panel like Delano, Creep, Shaggy have definitely fueled my love for music. Seeing them perform and being creative is something that inspired me, you know, to branch out on my own and bring my own flavor to the music industry as a female. Um, the biggest stage that I have performed on would have been in Toronto. So I did, um, I ventured into doing soca music now. Um, I did a festival called Caribana, which is their soca reggae festival in Toronto. Um, apart from that, I did some of the biggest clubs in there. I was blessed to have the opportunity to work with some really talented local DJs in Toronto as well. So, you know, with that being said, it, it gave me the leverage to kind of get to a, a better place or maybe skip a few steps. Um, which I'm not really trying to skip any steps, but you know, I had I had the opportunity to to really work on some cool things, which has made my resume very long. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> Pantasan, where are some of the locations in which you have carried the sound system culture? Well, you know, I have the Juna version of Pink Panther, which is called Pantasan Movement. You understand? So I've been on tour with Tommy Lee, World Europe Tour, 20 countries in Europe. You understand? I've been to Canada, I've been to most of the Caribbean islands. So, and I have festivals coming up this summer. I have a festival coming up with um, Luciana in Montreal, and a next one with um, Barrington Levy in Quebec. So, I've been touring as an artist DJ along with playing music on a sound system. But my, my tours are more likely, it's not the juggling tour, it's more like, like a special appearance. You understand? Like a special appearance, like 15 minutes before an artist performs. That's the type of appearance I do. You know, so I travel around the world, I've been to most of the European countries and understand the different types of juggling set. You understand? Because I've been to even South America, Costa Rica, and these places where 90s dance hall is the prime time of the dance. So we are playing 90s in an early part, then we are playing in a prime time. And most of the dance hall we play in Jamaica, they know we play it over there. So you know, it, you have to broaden your horizon to music and your approach to music. Because as we say, um, T.O.K. and Buccaneer and General Degree are like Michael Jackson over Costa Rica. So you have to know the music and know say, it doesn't revolve around the scene that you're seeing here. You know, because every territory has their own style. And those people, they're stuck on, like them clocks stuck on the 90s and they refuse to move it. So no matter what you tell them, say, a 90s dance hall, they say over them side of the world. So you have to know how to adjust and don't be like a one-sided DJ where you just tell yourself, say, yo, them sang your hat and make go play them. Because no, you have to know how to adjust. There are people in Europe where nobody knows about in Jamaica that when you go to Europe, you have to find them, download them song and play it in the dance. So you have this ability to adjust while touring also. So it's not about just playing everywhere and you know it's a same as Creep says it's a learning process. Everywhere you go, every country you go, you learn about a new artist, you learn about a new song. So it's it's ability to adjust anywhere you go in the world. Boy oh boy. I mean maybe we would say nineties dance or we're stuck in that mode in Jamaica too, right? But I don't want to get myself in a trouble right now. So I'm going to leave that alone for the minute. I want to just follow up with you though. Like, what would you say has been your biggest achievement in the sound system business thus far? Well, my biggest achievement is playing on the same event with my father in Canada. When you can, no say, 
your 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 generation and your father generation will be seen on the same level and booked for the same event. You know, that's my biggest achievement because my father is my idol. You know, I do this for him, you know, and I don't care about nobody else. So before I shift into some conversation about the structure, the enabling environment, the kinds of things we want to do policy-wise, I want to ask you, Shaggy, if you could tell the youth today something about the foundation of the music with sound systems that helped you major help and by which they could be helped, what would that be? You mean in specific things that has happened to me or just in general? Specific things specific. that have happened to you? Well, for me, I remember the first time, when there's a song called Big Up, Big Up, which is a massive, massive hit for me. But that, those songs, Big Up and I, a song called Mampe, were massive hits in New York, Tri-State area, in, in Miami. Um, but none of those songs were released in Jamaica with no distribution. At that point, we're putting them out on a little label named Signet in New York at the time, me and Steve International. And we we'll put those records out. The two major distribution in Jamaica was Sonic Sound and Dynamic Sounds. So we never put our records through them. We just didn't know them. We didn't know who them was. Because my thing really happened out in New York City. And those songs were massive, 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 massive. So I remember one time there was a clash between Addis and Stone Love. And we get a car and say, Rory from Stone Love, wow, come down to the studio. When we got a studio, it was all New York artists. It was me, Red Fox, Screechy Dan, Bacha Jed, Nike Fungus. You know, every New York artist you know that had these big records was who um, Rory Vice. And it was a unique strategy because at that point, the money where most of the biggest don't play them are, are like, them are way more bone to kill and way more bunch of them. You know what I said? And, and Rory just came in, read the temperature of the city at that point, and decided that he's going to voice all of the New York artists. And at the night, when the Clash of One and Alice load up with a holy pop of one tequila, a holy pop of one, and re, re, re. Rory come with a tune in the old Carolina. And he say, hey, thinking so boy, you're a boy. Go wash your granny red. <laughs> and mash up. And the place just turn over. And the play a big eye for pack up, pack up. He did so boy, pack up. And the place just proper, proper, proper shell, 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 shell. And it was an upset because that is at that time one of the biggest, biggest things to all of coming, but the man him take a whole different strategy. Where at that time Addis, you know, the trend was really for us to play all of the Akata Sebranch. So we the but we the most place. And we have all of them, them sang there. What Rory did was further on, he came to Jamaica and was at House of Leo and decides that them two the women play and bust of the place than New York, he might go dry it at Jamaica House of Leo. And the man draw all Carolina shell long in there. Right, and from that point, that's how people start to get involved with Shaggy. He also did it when we did it, Bedwalk Sensation, because we did the, uh, bed, oh, for the Boombastic beat, we did one song for, for Mercy, Bedwalk, Bedwalk Sensation, we did produce, we did put out a tune at home, for Big Al at the time. And he was the man with the draw the tune and draw Boombastic right after Bedwalk Sensation with Merciless and them tune to come big. So that was kind of introducing Shaggy seen as a, as, a, as a new artist and a brand and them through them, that became, it ended up becoming big, massive international songs, but Rory kind of figured it out from before. That's just him re re reading the room again and reading um, the city at the time to bring it. So to me, the sound system was very, very important at that point to bring us legitimacy, you know what I mean? And, and, and um, it was really great. So I think, it, which leads me to another point, I don't really want to go in there, but it, it, you know, it is a dying breed at this point, and you know, we want to basically protect that as it is, because then they ever say a, a, a thing where uh, Mighty Crown said they want to fear well, fear, fear well, fear well, clash, fear well tour. I mean, oh, Mighty Crown from a fear well. So you have to tell me, the, the, the culture where they build them whole empire upon dead. To me, we just couldn't, so we couldn't endorse it. In other sense, big or mighty crowd, but we just can't endorse it because to me, it's not a, a, 
it's not a thing we can die because it is still so needed. I think it's them putting down the, the records though. If they were deciding that they weren't going to tour or Yeah, but I don't think, you think the marketing? Come here and say, what am I going to put them, put them so, make them so much? <coughs> Unless they feel like it now make them so much. You know, I mean, if you know better than me, maybe you know, come and give the time to chin. <laughs> They're still touring, right? I don't no, know. No. I, it's the no, Farewell no, Tour done? No, no, yeah, I don't think they're still touring right now. That was the last show, show. <laughs> unless I'm a plan for doing another Farewell. <laughs> <laughs> we, shall, we shall have to consult with them on this matter. So, um, Delano, sound system culture is not just about sound. It's the, the wider culture is embedded in fashion. Unique forms of adornment. There's dance, language, and, and so much more. What is your thought? This is trouble now. May I try get you? Know? What is your thought of the strictures in place around the use of profanity? I mean, there's a time and place for everything. I mean, <laughs> profanity. I mean, well, Jamaica and Barbados is one of the biggest thing across the world. There is indeed a bumper clap festival. Right. Okay. Thank you. You said the word. <laughs> But I can go if they lock you up, never say no. Never say no. No, never say what's the meaning. Well, I mean, going to all these different countries all over the world that don't even speak English. But once I walk out on the stage and I say, Bob McLeod, the place mash up. I don't even play the first song. <laughs> you understand? So it just depends. Because some people don't even take it as bad word. You understand? But in terms of profanity, yes, you have. If, it, if it's an adult event, I don't think it should be a problem, right? right. So if you're, if you're doing an event that involves kids, then I have a problem with that. You understand? So here's a place of time for everything. So probing the same question though, if chromatic, if you're in an event, clearly Jamaican music has some, you know, sort of, it's the, the culture of profanity is, is there. We can't get away from it. But how do we manage the aggression though? Because a lot of the times, the music is aggressive. And the music will cause those persons either in the event or playing, suppose it's a clash, to get aggressive. How, 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 how do we manage this aggression? I think it's just about being professional is that what we do, which I would hope that we all are at this level and conduct yourself in the respective manner. But, uh, well, from a DJ standpoint, in my case, it, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm mindful of obviously having edited versions to the songs that need to be, you know, having it, but it's, uh, it would probably fall more on the MC. In, in many of these cases because in some cases when I get booked for an event they say no profanity they're really actually speaking on the MC not you know overdoing the profanity or um, just respecting all, all groups of peoples you know um, so for me I don't really get booked for too many events where I have to play edited music um, my managers are mindful of, of that because it, for, for me, for some songs it takes away, you know, but uh, time and place as Delana said, time and place. you just have to be mindful and, you know, be a professional. So the highest form of commercialization that we have seen in the sound business so far was attempted by Red Bull and I stand to be corrected if anybody has any other example. They had these culture clashes, which they toured on several continents. Jamaica was actually the last stop. Will you remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, last stop. No, 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 in other words, they, they're, well, okay, so Jamaica, the, the, the last stop Jamaica was a few years ago. What more do we need? Because this was external validation in a sense. We don't have any big commercial push behind sound system. So that Red Bull culture clash would have been external validation again for our culture. What more do we need to do to secure and at this point expand sound business in Jamaica? That's anybody on the panel. Well, check, check, check. 
sound system culture is not respected in Jamaica. That's the first thing. Um, there's no, yeah. there's nobody. There's nobody. All right, everybody is blaming the government, right? But there's nobody to educate the government about sound system culture. There's nobody to petition the government at the same time. Yes, we have to organize ourselves. We have to organize ourselves. Oh, nice. Organize ourselves. We have to get. You know, and on petitions and stuff like that to basically get the government member. You know, you have Minister Grange, but she cannot go do so much if she don't have numbers for proof to them. So, you know, right. this and this are, are going. So, that definitely is a, a, a part of it. And, and I think about it is ego too, because you have so much sound system. And we try many times to get, get sound system together. Because sound system bigger out of Jamaica. You understand? And a lot of people don't understand why we had sound system in the first place. And tell me if I'm wrong. Um, when back in the days they used to produce Jamaicans producing Jamaica music, the radio station wasn't playing no Jamaica music, they only were playing was foreign music. So how they bring get people to hear the music that they were producing? They built sound system and played on the streets. So they couldn't promote their songs. So it always have always been getting a fight. So basically, the sound system needs that kind of, as you said, to come together and fight for the sound system so it can be bigger. Because sound system, when it says something like they said, reggae and dance are creating hip hop, I think that's, that's a different kind of thing. It's really sound system culture yes. creating yes. hip hop. Yes. Right? So there's a lot of messages over there. Big up, big up, yes. Right? So, that's why I'm saying to you that how we come together now and make people know what is sound system culture. How we do it. Man like Shaggy keeping all these kind of this conference, letting us know our people can understand what is happening in terms of our culture. The Red Bull culture, trust me, is one of the biggest things we respect it to the to the ground. First time we see it. And then it come to Jamaica and it get the support. But when uh, a Panther someone and I mean, Big Panther and the Kilimanjaro and whatever, they don't get that kind of crowd. They don't get that kind of support. So Jamaicans and a whole still don't respect the South Kingdom culture. Now. It's not just, it's, it, it's a whole thing behind it. But yet still, when a foreigner do it, mm -hmm. it big. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? One, one other thing too is, we can sit down now. When you talk about the nice of being, man, right? It does not live like so to me, because we're a cultural hub and we are the symbol of culture throughout the Caribbean, I just think there should be a certain amount of leeway. You know, again, this might take organization, this might take us good get together. But remember, we deliver the um, Albemarle E17 around the sun. We used to have a train track around behind the, behind the building. You, you know what I'm talking about? So when the train run here, it goes, and that run all kind of night. So the first time you go in, I said, forget the apartment now. I said, you know, that trainer, yo. I stay up all night, me, this is something I run behind me. Yo, what do you want now? The apartment, I go for a good amount of money. I said, you know, you know something I take. I'm going to tell you, you're dead for a while. I don't even feel damn trainer, but I said, that's the sound system culture to me in Jamaica. Me raise with the music. Me raise with the music. Me raise with the music. Me raise with the sound system culture to me in Jamaica. Me raise with my wind of the machine at night time. Right from me, I lick up why till now. So I understand how some people make it look like, oh my lord, my window is shaking and I cannot sleep. How much I want to sleep with the TV on? Like the TV on, like nice here, here. No. Yeah. No for them doing. So to me, it's just hypocrisy at the end of the day, they must sit up with this thing about, oh yo, yo, it is bothering my neighborhood. Yeah. And blah, blah, blah. Me living in a nice neighborhood and more time years. I just saw it go apart, apart, and what we grew up on. To me, that is culture. I just saw it go. It now stopped me from sleeping. Yeah, see, true. that takes us into the enabling environment, the kind of infrastructure that is needed, and some of the responsibility rests on government in terms of facilitating that. And so you would have heard conversations about developing entertainment zones, for example. You know, why it is we can't have certain zones that you can't go and play morning till night. And then, of course, not to bring this in really, because it's another troublesome topic, is why does carnival get treated a certain way? And that's how not the same, but, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Is there anybody else on the panel who wants to respond? Yeah, but I'll respond to that because we are support. Dance all, dance all play 90% of the time in Trinidad. 
Only time soca play a Trinidad. Ninety nine percent. Ninety nine. Only time soca play a Trinidad is during carnival. After that, I'm being answered. So, oh, we are support a culture we support we more than themselves. Because they, they support dance and more than soca over there. As much as they facilitate, facilitate, facilitate their um, carnival, mm -hmm. when carnival done, they selected them actually and glad to pay dancers. Yes. They're glad. More dancer events keep in Trinidad than soca. Mm -hmm. You understand? More Jamaican artists perform in Trinidad more than all Trinidad artists perform in Jamaica. Yeah, and we are in us, the soca culture so hard. And then take dance and hug it up so. Mm -hmm. You have a festival in Trinidad called Great Fet. Every time an artist is booked, it keeps Saturday night. You know when the artists perform 8 a.m. Sunday morning? Breakfast time. Yeah, breakfast time. And the event done 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. So dance hall events are finishing at 10 a.m. the following day in Trinidad. And dance hall events in Jamaica can't pass 2 o'clock. So lucky if I get 2 o'clock. And even last night we tried TJ, TJ's performing you see? at by the campus. Police come 1 o'clock to lock up TJ performance. 1 o'clock. On a Saturday night. On a Saturday night. Saturday. Not a Sunday. So I want to go back to what Delano said though. There's something that we are not doing here to promote, to preserve, to, to, to really love our own culture. Why we are in this place? Because everybody else, Kingston is the noisiest city on the planet. People know us for noise. What I call sound, because noise to me is a pejorative word. It's not noise when it's enough money. It's business behind the noise, right? Yeah. There's something that we are not doing. Well, it starts from how long now? It starts how long now, right? In terms of Reggae music and dance song music and sound system was always associated with something bad. Either drugs, murder, whatever it is. So that stereotype still carried up to this day. You understand? Because if you wasn't selling drugs, you couldn't afford a song. A song we go up and see it. Because reggae music never used to play in certain people's household. You understand? Because I had family like that. Because I was the bad. I was a bad one out of the group, called me out here, called me up here, everything, they play dance, all. what's that, Junior, what's that you're playing? You understand? Well, Calypso played the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah Calypso played, and, and, and Frank Sinatra, and Frank all those things, and, and yeah, Country I, I music. mean, I, I have so much of those albums from my father days, but I'm saying to her, I couldn't really play dance all in time, you couldn't even play Bob Marley, remember? So all of that is coming. So people have understand say coming from back then. Colonialism. How, how we, yeah, right. So how do you change that now? So now when you talk to some police, the first thing they look at you are like, oh you're coming with those boogie aga music, no boogie aga this and boogie aga that. So it's it's all cemented in the head from ever since. So how do you know how can we convince them now that this is the this you know our culture start a holy part of genres? Or me playing at dance or festivals, other parts of the world, and me going at, as it said, 10 o'clock in the morning, and they said, okay, I need to You know, right? I know you won't come in, Shaggy, but just let me qualify what you've just said a while ago. Jamaica is credited with, depending on who you speak to, indigenous musical genres, at least seven of them, eight, depending on who you're speaking to. And I've mapped already about 64, at least, that we have influenced just in the latter half of the 20th century and this is this is real sound innovation now because Jamaican music no musical genre since the 1960s has escaped influence from Jamaican music and the, the number of genres of music developed in Jamaica we, we, we have to go back to sound system culture to understand the kind of innovation in terms of that music and 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 we don't know that so there's a role for conferences such as IMC for global reggae conferences at the University of the West Indies, for institutions like Alpha, to be able to educate people about the music. It's not just about a song and a dance. Shaggy. Yes. You want to say something from a long time? No, no, no. Let's no, 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 just a, 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 a reiterate. Before we go to questions. Yeah, a reiterate with, with, with what Emma said. I, and we should really look at the value of what it is as a, as a culture. And just like you said, you make some... some incredible points you know even when you say that you know hip-hop which 
you know, has garnered probably over some 10 billion years, you know, I mean, within that one particular genre, which no other genres really done that within a short space of time, within a 20 year span. You know, what I mean, it really came from sound system culture. I don't think the powers that be because of quote unquote colonialism style of thinking back in other days. Right. I still don't think that the powers that be here really look at dancehall or sound system culture right, uh, with that respect still to this day. They, they still look at it as you would say boogie and music because they come from that scene. You know, see. So anyway, Q&A, let's hold it. Q&A. Yeah. Well, we have one minute and 19 seconds and counting. Any question? Who are the mic? And open Put up your hands so we can see if you have any questions. Spread the bars in the front as well. This has been a really interesting conversation. Yeah, there start, are some start things up, that we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Question, yeah. question. Yeah. Yes. All right, hi guys. My yes. name is Deja. I'm an artist like most of you guys. I have a question for the whole panel. Um, historically, radio used to break records until maybe the 80s and the 90s, where sound systems and spinning records became a mainstream thing, with mainly remixing records, which created two new genres, house and hip hop, like you guys talked about right here. So I want to know, why is it that the culture no longer leaves itself open to finding new talent and breaking new records, thus closing off one of the channels by which groundbreaking and pioneering, pioneering musical works would come to be? I just want to know, why is it that we're not, as DJs, like being groundbreaking and pioneering anymore, or working with new talent and new artists to find the next thing that's coming out to make the culture great, if you understand me? I think there's a lot of that being done. Now. Well, I, 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 I think, would like I to differ. From when, when, when we listen to a song, we go, we go, up to Monday, said that day, but I will leave on the tune the man in my dry now. I will leave on the wood. Many of you are here, where is it now? We can't hear, but you're the mic for me now, we're your chassis. Go on again. I do disco, I do pop, right? I'm yeah. also, I mean, I know Sharon Burke and a lot of people here. Yeah. And I've kind of been in the background watching the whole thing play out. And I've noticed that usually it's either the people with the links or the artists who are already somewhat um, made that get their songs played. And I'm, I'm not here to pop my collar. I don't want to do that. But I'm saying there are people like me out here, we're doing, we're doing different type of music. And I truly believe in what I'm doing. I know yeah. other people believe in what they're doing. And I think it can be groundbreaking if people on the panel would give us a chance and listen to us and really see, hmm, yeah, it's different, but it can do something. All right, so you're you just the quiet. You're you just the quiet. You said the people that were the links, right? You're in the place where the links are. It's your job to make the link. Are. It's your job to make the link. It's your job to be in people's faces. These people that you see up here that are doing it and getting that shine, it's because they're doing that legwork. You That's don't know true. the amount of people come to me within this thing where I have a fan of myself, brother, I can't do it right now. And I'm going to shoot something at me and say, oh, brother, you have to listen to this now. Where your email, where this. That's you doing your leg work yeah. to get your, and if it's, you got to understand, if you come with a type of music, him have a play of music, we have a beat fit in for it. So if you come with a country and western record for a play in the middle of the night because you are experiment, and him a play in a dance hall setting, you can't manage for early one, you get it you, you understand me? I said, me like it, so I'm going to play it now the early one. If now I'm going to play it now in prime time, because when that man come over here, so I'm going to mash him up, and he might get the food, and he's not going to go with nothing. Well, well, yes, but they are breaking it. You now have to alter your music and, and create what is known as a hybrid. Uh, no, no, you can't mix it up. No, here we are. Let me let me answer the question. It's not every selector or sound system can break every music, yes. right? Hold on, we're in a different time now, where you have millions of selectors playing music right about now, and one party, and each of them get fifteen minutes, thirty minutes. They're not going to experiment, sir. They're not going to experiment with music. They will they will do research. Some of them will do research and say, you know what, I like that song, you know. I'm going to try to remix it so it can play with a hot song then. Radio stations supposed to be the, the ones that break it songs. Right? right? And that not happen either. But it's a different, yeah, but you see what I'm saying to you that DJs, and it's not every DJ can break a song. So it's, as it's, as Shadi said, you have to do the legwork until you find that right DJ, that right selector to break your type of song. 
That's how I look at it because I've been doing it for years. It's me who I busy signal about. We break busy signal. We break Vegas. Dirty Cup crew up to Sean Paul is Renaissance first. Right? In terms of we do, I know I do the leg work. I, I, I did I, I did I did my work, but there's not there's so much where you have a sound system, it's pure selector about. Right, and they are going to play their 15 minutes of fame. See, and, but you know, so maybe something can help you too. Just go ahead and try and at the same time. See, is is if if you're coming with a different style of music, where where you find hard to break in at this arena, because it's, a, it's mainly a dance hall arena, and you kind of because I have the same thing. I make music, which is hybrid music. I'm sometimes you come some weird weird things. I want to say I wish I could cover this. But me, I'm a little bit of a, of a platform because me have a brand. But imagine when me they just start and I'm on a start and I want to do an R&B song, Mr. Brady, I'm coming. You understand what I said? So for you, what, what I did was find some other avenues to do, to, to do it. So I would create a buzz elsewhere. See, I did a lot of television at that time, but I want to say, yo, I don't know who that brother is, but I'm help a ring brother, I'll see one song, yeah. And you create a buzz. So you, maybe you could take that other direction by, by literally creating something, maybe on social media, to create the buzz, to that make them go ahead and try it. Sorry. Um, next question. Oh, um, I was just Sorry. adding to what you were saying by answering her question because my suggestion to you would be to develop your marketing. You know, maybe you can create a, a blast where you find different DJs' emails and you send out your music. You have to make sure that your social media is on point so that your image is out there, your sound is out there. You can't just depend on the DJs creating that for you. So that's how Mm -hmm. Use hashtag. If you do house music, search hashtag house music DJs. Hashtag is how you find niche. That's how everybody is grouped. Hashtag. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's the last question. All right. So what I was gonna say, you were talking about the important. Well, first of all, I want to send a big shout out going out to Kenny McIntyre. You know, he's the one that you know developed the Red Bull Sound Clash thing there and brought the Sound Clash into the corporate world. So. Big up to them, and uh, yeah. All right. So on the importance of uh, the artist them and, and sound system culture, it was very important for the artist them. I think for me because um, it taught the the artist them, especially when doing dub plates, how to do the voice projection. When it was dub plates back in the day, it was on steel. It was one lick on the dead one plastic. You can afford to make a a mistake, so that helped with the performances and all that too. Also, with sound system culture, teaching well coming from where I came from with forty fives. I learned about the artist them, you know, the name, the rhythm, you know, the, where the place was that they voiced the song and all these things. So when it came to a sound system culture, if I didn't know how to find an artist or whatever the case is, I would know the address from the label and I would just go to the studio where, and then do my work there. Um, so just the importance of sound system culture, I just thought I'd point out. And uh, Shaggy, I just wanted to correct you, the Baja Jed, that was on the Old Carolina rhythm. Mavis was on the bombastic rhythm. Oh, that's what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> and that's from learning from the labels and sound system culture once again, too. It's really sad because it's really putting them tune out. <laughs> when you put someone's songs out, you know, you kind of think, what can we say? One, one more question, if you don't mind, Shaggy. As I'm a sound boy killer, where why Cliff killer? Pop, 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 pop. pop. <laughs> Dump it to me name. I got one dump to my name and it's a big dump it. Based off of what you said, Shaggy, that you gave Rory and Stone off some dubs, yeah? And it helped bust old Carolina and other songs. And then hearing the conversation about um, the government not helping sound system instead of everything like that, I want to just try and mix it up a little bit. Knowing how important sound clash culture is to sound systems and now knowing the price panther sun of dub plates do you not feel that the dub plate prices right now is helping to kill sound clash culture because if you think about the price of a dub plate right now but average is like what four five hundred dollars but what is the average sound price that a sound system is getting paid to play out how many dubs can you buy based on your income as a sound system Sound if we answer that, how much freedom do you get from? No, no, no. I, mean, you, I only put free. 
I do, free, I do, I do get holy for free dubs. I do get holy for free dubs. You're but asking for your friends. I'm, I'm no, I'm asking for the community of sound systems because I love sound clash culture. But knowing that these sounds can't get to play at barrage, at alkaline, at barrage, at popcorn, the prices are escalated and gone through the roof. And I think that is helping to kill sound clash culture. So I put that question to you, Panther. And I also put that question to Shaggy, who I know is not cheap for the plates as well. I lost freedom that you're about to call You're wicked, you man. Fantastic. Yes, Bexer, send them to me. <laughs> no. Alright, but I agree with you. The prices are getting outrageous. And the reason being, like, um, it's, it's, it's a cultural thing because you see, this new generation of artists, their dependency on DJs to bust their music is less. So, them respect and them, like I said, homage when they have to pay to the DJ, then they don't really feel them have a friend, no man. You understand what I say? Because on the internet, bust them song. And most of them both so you, call like, so you don't think that's a wrong move? No, it's a wrong move, but okay, it's human right. nature. But may I explain because you have to explain why they, they are like this. You know? So it's human nature because a man say, yo, we never depend on a selector for both of the song and the internet bosses. We never got a road go thing there. So if a man from the road call me and want me to be for pay with my money. And so them, that's the mentality they have. But secondly, hold on then. Secondly now, you see, it has to do with the ego at the same time. We remember I said no plate is the first money an artist see before they even start getting booked for a show. Yeah. You understand? So some of them see it as like they might try to make the most out of no plate that try to buy house and car and land, pay a five girl rent. So it's, <laughs> it's a thing where it's a thing where they might try to milk it when they don't feel milk it, they use it as a marketing strategy, same as Oshaki said, you know, yeah only for DJs, free dogs, as we say, it has to do with, with, with them themselves. You understand? And when they have to go through for reach when they're there. So sometimes cer certain people attitude and, and them outlook on the business, you can't really blame them because they don't know how them upcoming. And when they have to go through for reach when they reach. So everybody has their own. The selector has their own cry when they say the price is outrageous. It's a man like me you now when they're on both sides and understand the business because I'm a selector and I'm an opening agent. I mean if you talk to them and say, listen, it is a man cannot pay pay five hundred dollar for a dog, and and a and a children that ever get paid for the dance. You understand? So I've been I've been lobbying for this. We even put out newspaper article. It's even on my website, pantasun.com. Pantasun said the prices are not paid too expensive. So I'm doing my part in influencing this new generation. But you must understand where they're coming from. So they, it doesn't make them a bad person. It's just that they struggle when they want to come up. You understand? It's not the traditional way where the selector they just give them a strength and they give them a strength. They vice a song in them house, they put it on YouTube, it get popular, and then the selector boss it. You understand? Because as we say, music come out of the hands of the radio and the DJs are gone to the internet. So everybody feel like them is a label. You realize the artist no longer a link producer or produce song no more. Everyone just want to download a rhythm off of YouTube, vice it, and put it out because one RP is easy to put up song. You know, everybody is becoming an independent person. So it's the independence in the business. That's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah everybody feels like you're not everybody. everybody is a producer. And everybody is a producer, but one of them feel like they can do everything. Yeah. Well, let me, so, know, let me know when the record will go far. <laughs> so is, 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 is that really a mess of the business? It's because they all look on it. Because they are easy for vice and it is easy for me to do this. So they don't feel like they need people. So Sean and me, we're going to ask Panta as the president of the Doublet Association to take your, your, your concerns. Yeah, to the yeah, community. Love it, love it. Continue to take your concerns to the community. Hold on, we only have yeah. two minutes left. And I want us, if there's only one burning question left from the audience, who has the microphone? before I ask each panelist to tell us their final words. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marvin Anderson and I was a part of the songwriters uh, workshop for the last two days. It was a very, very good experience. Shaggy, thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, thank you everybody. Thank you, Mikey Bennett, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the, as far as the uh, sound clash culture goes, I believe artists have to not be so greedy. Back in the days when sound clashes were going on, artists were lined up to just get on the mic with any rhythm that go and spit the lyrics. And that's why the sound clash is going. If today 
it was that to happen, the sound clash will come back because if Panta straight up and playing in uh, Christiana and Joshi gonna come through, Alkaline coming through, Idonia coming through for free, everybody's gonna be there. Yeah, but that's it. That that you miss miss it miss it people string up on my man coming come. Yeah, so that that happened. You know what I mean? No, we have kind of happened already. People, they still, the man I'm on the run up on, but it depends on if it's a, is, is a, a notable song. The man I run up with the mic, but new artists do that. Sometimes big artists do that. You know what I mean? So it, it still happens. I just think at this point, for make it become a big, a bigger thing, certain, certain things have, have to change. The culture, I say, it has to become cool again. Right? You need a cool factor to bring, to come back to, 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 to um, sound system um, thing. And, and you know, I've been talking to, to even chip about some, some other ideas because I have a whole other ideas which have been on this close, but oh, we could do that. But me and Chip did have a little conversation. Said, but there's something I would want to touch on the thing where you showed me today. I want to ask, ask Shani B. Shani B. You, you know about that? That's something where you have to pay a license? DJ's license. DJ licensing? DJ license. Yeah, so, but, but they sell so much internationally, they're England. They're not England, they come from. So you're not being a license? So are you telling me it's BS? Yeah. So, you so, it, so you have your license? What oh, do you mean you're not? Yeah, we know yeah, I understand the venue, so. Yeah. So the DJ. So is it something that is true where DJs are now gonna have to play license to play a party? Yeah, but them but them link them link you don't. Yeah, every time something called them link me. Yeah, they know the rich people. I disagree with the rich people. I did verify with one of our collecting rights organizations in Jamaica. And yes, DJs are required to take out a license because of the copying of the music. We so, understand. yes, promoters and venues and so What do you mean copying? Because... If you have three DJs, if you have three selectors, sharing a hard drive. Or oh, sharing. Oh. Copying the music to be able to distribute to different selectors in a particular conglomerate. So Renaissance, for example, you have four or five, six selectors, you're sharing the music. And so there's that requirement. But we're going to educate ourselves a little bit more about compliance. Yeah, I disagree. About, no, 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 no. Well, it's not for disagreement. It's something <laughs> the regulation right now. So we just have to educate ourselves about it and to be able to have Jamaica be one of the most compliant in terms of the music business, and that's one of the areas of where we come. Last words, future of sound system. I want to take your cool factor as your last word, Shaggy. Last words with sound system business in the future. Where are we going? As you said, it's a cool factor. We have to, um, it seems like it's old school. Clash, it seems like it's old school. It's for old sound and old this. So how are you going to make it feel young again? Well, you clearly see when I when 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 um, Wycliffe yeah. um, go up against the big bad general where yes. <laughs> and, and all the players rip up. Right. And, and that was a whole school that were all ages in, inside us also. Yeah. But the next thing though, in terms of the, the, the dog plates and uh, expensive dog plates, that's been going on a long time. So it's not new artists. That's why I had to come up with remixes. I had to innovate myself. We started the remix crazes in Jamaica. I couldn't afford dog plates back then. Trying to be star remix though. So it's not just expensive dog plates. It's not a man streaming up on the side of the road and beaching on the sound. It's just that it's not cool anymore. That's all it is. Chromatic. Last words. Where's the sound system business going? I mean, I, I've always noticed over the latter years that there, there's been less sound systems being. It, it's, it's really not cool for the. For the newcomers into the business, they'd rather be a solo DJ, solo MC, and freelance. You can do any any event with any DJ. It's it's actually probably more profitable for them at this point. Um, where 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 it's going, there's no telling. But hopefully, it's not you know a, a dying issue. You know. Josh. Well, um, I think, and sure to use it or lose it. Um, <laughs> Give the next, give the youths the, the, the tools. Let them decide where it goes. I think if you give it to them first, right now, it's very hard to find a sound system, let alone work on one. So, um, luckily, students at Alpha have the opportunity. But what is an equalizer? What, 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 where does this go? Those types of things. 
give them a chance and they'll decide, they'll lead us. Gabby? Um, well, my only note to that is my hope for where it's going is to bring back music that is not just trending but longevity. I guess the reference would be the 90s. I have to try and bring that back, so that's my two cents. Well, as the sound system is going more digital, I see DJs have more online shows than physical parties. So that's the trend I see going on, and I see it's expanding based on this whole blockchain and, you know, um, everybody having their own NFT. I see DJs making digital NFTs of themselves and playing in the metaverse. You understand? So that's where I see it going because, as I said, Black Eyed Peas had a concert in the metaverse. You understand? So that was a test of showing how, you know, DJs can make a version of themselves. So even our veteran DJs like um, King Jamis and Black Scarpion then can also make a digital version of themselves and create a set of them, like make a whole set, like a series, like how you don't watch on Netflix. You know, and make a digital version and still have their relevance in this age. You're watching a real time? It happened in a real time, like when you're watching? When I watch it, no, man, yeah. they, they actually record it and, and oh, make an animated it. version. I'm I'm say, if it's if it going in a real time, I mean, yeah. where you can probably I mean, watch it on your device or put on your camera as a web and you're inside and the dance. Inside, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that that's, that's, at least somebody yeah. now get shot. Yeah, yeah that's, that's <laughs> where I see it going. It's, I see it going more digital based on, on, on the technology. Yeah. So I see sound system DJs, you know, you have to adapt, as we say, you have to adapt. You see these things going on, more DJs going on TikTok and making more money than they ever make playing anywhere. AI dubs, no, AI dubs can never replace real dubs because the AI don't have the creativity. You can't always say the thing, but you can't come up with it. Well, we are going to see. No, and, yeah, on they, that, and on that note, Never yeah, no, you can't listen. Wait, 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 you wait, think, wait, wait. I, I know about dance and culture. You have certain things in our culture where if an AI come up with it, you must be God. No, but because, the same people no, the same because the words, the words we choose to use back at each other, it, it, it is a no format. I remember so everything in, in, in AI and technology goes off of data input and coding That's based correct. on a specific data language. Input. No, yes. based on a specific coding language. So if we're saying things that is not in the dictionary, the AI cannot repeat it or duplicate it. They'll catch up with us at some point. But I want us to thank our panelists. This has been very exciting. We're out of time. Thank you very much, everybody.